Uh, Elke Weber is a professor in energy and the environment and professor of psychology and public affairs in the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, which is a wonderful interdisciplinary department uh, dealing with environmental science. Um, uh, Elke is one of the most important psychologists today, studying judgment and decision making and the risk and uncertainty, broadly speaking. And I will just quote her research philosophy. Uh, she believes that psychological theory needs to interface with social problems in a two-way dialogue, proving itself to be constructive solutions in real-world settings and being enriched and constrained by those settings. And I couldn't agree more. I'm happy to um, give it to Elke. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for your kind introduction and everyone, uh, hello. I wish I could be with you in person, uh, but let me share my screen and we can get started on my presentation. So I want to talk to you about decision-making in complex realities. And what I mean by that is, you know, situations that pose challenges to sustainability and also to collective action. And they are typically characterized by deep uncertainties, especially in the collective action context about the actions of others. Uh, they have informational challenges, but also cognitive and motivational uh, strengths and, and barriers. Um, and lastly, there's not a single sort of set of decision makers, but we have a complex and very diverse set of actors and stakeholders in these uh, content domains. Uh, they differ by the type of agent. Are we doing, dealing with individuals, households, corporations, NGOs, and so on? But also each of those types of actors can have differences in their goals and their time horizon, uh, the power they hold, uh, the trust they have in other actors, information, and so on. So... You all know that our time period has been called the Anthropocene uh, by, to denote the fact that it's increasingly human behavior and human decisions, uh, oftentimes related to energy technologies and energy use, that are shaping uh, our environment. Um, and uh, the question is, who are these decision makers? Uh, and the assumptions about assumptions about human perception or comprehension uh, and choice are typically implicit, but the implicit assumptions, especially in political science, in traditional economics, uh, and in policy contexts, are uh, one of rational updating and of rational choice. So we're dealing with homo economicus. Um, and perceptions, uh, risk, for example, uh, or benefits and other comprehensions of the situation are oftentimes at best considered exposed. Uh, when it comes to implementation or marketing of products and policies, uh, and especially if sales don't go very well. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, it took the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, until its fifth assessment report in 2014 to even first mention non-rational decision processes uh, in, 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 in one of their reports. And we actually, we had to smuggle it in uh, in a chapter on risk management. So... Let me tell you for the remaining uh, 25 minutes or so how people, how homo sapiens, we differ from homo economicus. So what should you know about uh, this species, us? Uh, we are subject to finite attention and to finite processing capacity. Uh, Herb Simon actually sort of got uh, a Nobel Prize in economics for this insight on bounded rationality. Uh, and if you have finite attention, finite processing capacity, you have to husband it carefully. So we you tend to focus on the here and now that gives rise to myopia, to status quo bias, and to a variety of other sort of cognitive biases broadly defined. Uh, Homo sapiens has many goals. We have many goals, oftentimes conflicting ones. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, we do have self-focused goals. Yeah. And uh, Homo uh, economicus is not all wrong. It's just maybe too limited because we also have other focused goals. We have psychological goals. We want to be confident in our decisions. Uh, and it turns out that only the goals that are activated at a given point in time uh, are playing a role in our decisions. Uh, and so that this oftentimes gives rise to uh, uh, choice inconsistency because different goals can be motivated by different choice contexts or by different situations. The other important insight, and in fact, one that got uh, Danny Kahneman uh, the Nobel Prize uh, in economics uh, 20 years later, uh, uh, was instantiated in prospect theory by him and uh, Amos Tversky in 1979, is that we evaluate outcome in a relative fashion. Yeah, And so $1,000 are not good or bad in some absolute way, but it's com it compares, it, 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 the question is compared to what? If you were expecting a million dollars as you know, some uh, salary increase and you only get 900,000, know, yeah, that's not very good. But if you're expecting nothing and all of a sudden your yeah, money shows up, of course, that's a, it's a great outcome. Uh, and it turns out that so this relative encoding uh, is, is, is quite important because we can uh, provide 
decision makers with different reference points and therefore have them evaluate out, a given outcome in very different ways because the differences in risk attitudes uh, and also in, in value uh, as, as a function of whether it's seen as a gain or as a loss with loss aversion looming large. Also, we learn best by trial and error learning, learning by getting hurt. Uh, and so seeing some negative consequences of climate change, for example, yeah, makes people much more likely to believe that it's real. Seeing is believing. Uh, uh, we also are tribal. We are committed to our convictions, and oftentimes our beliefs are part of our social identity. And then, and those tribal beliefs or those beliefs in general influence how we perceive things. So seeing, uh, seeing is believing, but also believing is seeing. And then maybe most importantly, uh, we don't just have a scarcity of resources like finite attention or processing capacity. We also come with an abundance of resources in contrast to Homo economicus. So we have multiple ways in which we process information and make decisions. And yes, uh, many of those are calculation based in different ways, some in normative ways, some in sort of you know, poor, uh, poor substitute uh, heuristic ways. But calculation based decisions are one of the basic modes that comes as part of parcel of our you know, sort of evolution, evolutionary development of the prefrontal cortex. Uh, we have the wetware for it, but we have to send our kids to school to learn the, 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 the software. Uh, what comes more naturally? What is bred into our bones? Well, we naturally make decisions based on emotions. If it feels good, we approach, we exploit. If it's scary, we back off uh, and, and avoid. Uh, and then the third category of norms, of, of uh, decision processes that we have evolved, uh, often as part of our sort of cultural development, are rule-based decisions. So we make decisions based on moral rules of conduct uh, or standard operating procedures uh, in an organization. And, and those are rules that basically take advantage of the collective wisdom of, of, of past generations that have been encoded in, into these rules. Just to give an example of how decision modes make a difference, just reiterating here that we have affect, make affect-based decisions, calculation-based decisions, and role-based decisions. Uh, we gave uh, a customers of two uh, utility companies, one in Switzerland uh, and one in the United States, a choice between two uh, power options like brown electricity, you know, that was you know uh, generated by a variety of technologies, and, and a green electricity, a green power option that was somewhat more expensive, twenty percent more expensive. And by and large, uh, green power is very popular across the political spectrum in both countries. So two thirds of respondents actually uh, chose uh, the, the, the green power option. But after they made their decision, we also asked them to tell us on a scale from one to 10, to what extent were you using uh, calculation-based decision processes, uh, to what extent uh, you are using uh, emotion-based processes and what were those emotions, and to what extent were you using some rule or role and what was the rule, what was the role. And of course, we explained to them what, what, what these uh, different processing systems were. Um, and as you can see, when you put the, the responses to how much they used each of those three processing systems in their decisions they just made into a regression to, to predict whether they choose green electricity, uh, the choice of green electricity is the, the regression coefficient, standardized regression coefficient, the, the choice of green electricity went down the more they used calculation-based decisions, but it went up the more they used uh, emotion-based choices, and it went up the more they used rule-based choices. It often had to do with the identity at, 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 at good uh, citizens uh, and uh, cu custodians of the future of their children. So the implications of that is that we shouldn't just give people information in some format that uh, activates calculation-based decisions, uh, but like tables uh, and, and uh, inf numerical information, but also uh, include images or videos that prime affect or rule-based decision modes to promote uh, more pro-social decisions that are more likely to be activated by those processes than by calculations. Okay, let me also say something about the uncertainty that I alluded to as one of the challenges uh, in collective action uh, and in decision-making uh, in complex environments. Uncertainty in decisions comes from at least two sources. Uh, we all know about games against nature, risky decisions, where the outcome uh, of a given uh, choice that you make depends on, on, on chance events. Uh, and so should you take your umbrella in the morning? Well, that, that's a good decision. If, it's, if it ends up raining, it's a bad decision if, if, if it doesn't rain. And of course, we have normative theory for that out of economics, expected utility theory. And we have descriptive theory, uh, the prospect theory I mentioned earlier that incorporates reference, uh, reference dependent uh, uh, encoding of outcomes and, and loss aversion. Um, and But then the other source of uncertainty uh, in many situations has to do with interdependent choices. And so the outcome of, of an 
action doesn't depend just on what you chose, but also what did the other side chose in what cell of your game theoretic matrix you know, do, you, do you end up in? Uh, and so this, those are strategic decisions, economic games, uh, and the normative theory for that, of course, is game theory. Uh, and uh, there's also a descriptive uh, variant of that collect, uh, collected and developed by Colin Camera and then other uh, psychologists and behavioral economists uh, called behavioral game theory. So what are the, 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 the normative game theoretical decision processes? Well, we look for a dominant strategy. That's great. Uh, if you have sort of two dominant strategy, then you end up with a cell that's a Nash equilibrium. Uh, and in general, you assume that the other player is rational. That means self-interested uh, and uh, you know, just sort of having no emotions, but trying to maximize their own utility. And for some situations like zero-sum games, that gives rise to a maximum strategy, where you use a strategy that minimizes the minimum payoff you can expect because your minimum payoff will be their maximum payoff because it's zero-sum and they're rational. So that's the one they're going to choose. Um, and uh, yeah, well, for multiple player games, we have to you know, sort of somewhat more complex strategic reasoning. So the beauty contest game, for example, you know, sort of where n players have to guess a number between one and a hundred, and then the winner is the player whose guess is closest to two thirds or the average of 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 the guesses. You know, the question is which which number do you guess? And you know, you've probably all played this or in, in classes, you know, either as instructors or as students. Uh, and normative theory predicts, you know, that you should say zero, right? Because, you know, basically sort of by backward induction, uh, we can sort of figure out that sort of, you know, you know sort of the, the, the mean is 50 and two thirds of the mean is 33. And then, but, you know, if, if you're so smart, everybody else is also smart. And so you just recursively sort of go back to zero. Uh, uh, so the, all of these uh, Turn, so it turns out, you know, sort of uh, in, in, in reality, that's not the case. You know, so the Financial Times actually ran an experiment a number of years ago where the winning number was 13. Uh, and typically you find that backward induction is, is, is somewhat limited uh, in, in, in real decision makers. You know, we have the myopia that we talked about earlier because of attentional restrictions. And people typically think back between zero and two steps. Uh, but you can also sort of see that all of these game theoretic decision principles are more or less calculation based. Um, and so here's another uh, game, the ultimatum, uh. the ultimatum game, uh, uh, the test normative theory where sort of you, you split a total payoff between, you know, for, of a hundred dollars between you and somebody else. And if the other person declines what you propose, you know, sort of, you know, nobody gets any money. And again, the normative model predicts the responders should choose anything uh, greater than zero and should be happy with that because something is better than nothing. Uh, and uh, but what actually happens is people only say yes if they get at least thirty to forty percent, uh, and you know fifty percent of oftentimes being being the, being the norm, uh, and that sort of relates to uh, people using uh, either emotion based decisions because they're upset by the by the unfairness of of an unfair unequal offer, uh, or uh, that they sort of follow a rule that sort of says well sort of with 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 no merit on anybody's part, you know the the the, the split should be fifty fifty, so. One, one more, the prisoner's dilemma situation, uh, as you know, you know it's, it's a symmetric payoff, so a common knowledge game, uh, and the optimal strategy for every single player is to defect. Uh, and uh, of course, the collectively rational choice is, is to cooperate. Uh, and it turns out again, sort of when you, when you see what what happens, uh, you know, sort of hardly anybody you know, sort of defects all the time, even in repeated prisoner's dilemmas that relates back to the uh, limitations of uh, backward induction. Um, but turns out that empirically the best strategy uh, in this game is tit for tat, uh, with cooperation being the first move and then subsequently just matching what the other side did on the previous round. Uh, you could call that a rule, following a simple rule, and it's a rule that is quite effective because it's simple and therefore the opponent can figure it out. And once the opponent figures it out, the opponent will cooperate uh, and then you have you know, sort of more optimal outcomes down the road. Uh, but also it helps minimize the, if, uh, the effects of negative emotions, you know, the anger that you experience when you've been crossed in a, in a previous round or the envy that you experience with outcomes that the other person achieved that are better than yours. Uh, and it's a way of combining firmness with niceness. You know, there's retaliation, but also forgiveness. Uh, and so, as I said, defections in prisoner's dilemma uh, situations are not nearly as uh, severe as feared. Uh, and uh, one possibility might be that people actually are sort of somewhat uh, 
uh, limited in how they process the information. They might not think that this is an interdependent game. They just look at the, the, the cell that has you know, the, the, the advantageous payoffs and they say, well, why don't I choose this one? So is there any evidence for this egocentric processing bias? Uh, and uh, there was a very nice study by Shafir and Tversky back in 1992, where they told people actually in a prisoner's dilemma game that the other player had defected. And when they did that, 97% of those, you know, the respondents defected because they're not stupid. You know, they they, they know what's better for them when, when, when they know what the other side is going to do. And or they told another group of people that the other player cooperated and then 84% actually defected to take advantage you know, of, of, of that cooperation again, maximizing their, their, their own payoffs. But when the same sort of uh, population was told nothing about the other player, only 37% defected. And so it can't be that sort of all of these people processed what the other side would do, because regardless when they were told what the other side would do, regardless whether that information was that they defected or cooperated, they all defected. So obviously they had not thought processed very carefully the fact that this was uh, an interdependent uh, situation. Uh, so how do decision makers deal with uncertainty? Uh, well, one, one way to, we deal with uncertainty about what the other side will do uh, with the social uncertainty is by sort of social imitation. So we adopt the beliefs and attitudes and actions of, of what other trusted others think they, as the other side will do following social norms. Uh, and that oftentimes makes for, for partisan responses. Uh, and we see so much partisanship in, in today's world, you know, in, as a function of, for example, political parties. Uh, and then the other way we deal with the uncertainty about what the other sides would, 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 be, do, would be doing or what, what might be the case is we use immediate personal experiences. Uh, and so, you know, so what did we just see somebody else do? Uh, yeah, or in, 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 in not social situations, but in, you know, uh, in uh, uh, environmental situations, you know, have we just seen negative consequences uh, of, 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 of a, a coronavirus in our own lives? Uh, or you know, negative consequences of climate change in extreme weather. Hannah Arendt talked about personal experience as isolated islands of certainty in an ocean of uncertainty. And it very much so sort of ties into my remarks earlier about seeing as believing, evaluating uh, current information rationally or emotionally with worry triggering action. Uh, there's a phenomenon called local warming that shows that people make much more uh, generous contributions towards climate change, uh, NGOs, for example, or are much more worried about climate change on days that are warmer than normal. So that's another sort of phenomenon of using immediate personal experience uh, as uh, information, uh, not, in, not very probative, it's just a single data point, but uh, very salient to us psychologically. And the problem with that response is that make, it makes for responses to uncertainty that are reactive rather than proactive. We, we actually have to wait until we actually experience something. So I just want to show you some uh, a, a study where we pitted, in some sense, uh, both of these responses to uncertainty against each other, social imitation, and using immediate personal experience to see sort of how they fare uh, when both are in operation. Uh, and this was a study on both COVID-19 and, and climate change. Uh, those those are both uh, <laughs> issues, global issues that require international cooperation. They require rapid governmental responses, behavior change uh, on many fronts, uh, upfront costs to avoid negative uh, future outcomes, the differential risks and impacts, you know, as a function of your socioeconomic status, uh, and the nature of the threat is getting back to the uncertainty and dealing with uncertainty is largely unobservable, largely unknown uh, to most people, has to be communicated with complex scientific models. Uh, and there's an exponential pace of growth which makes immediate action uh, so important. Uh, and initially people thought we could maybe learn something from uh, our response to uh, the coronavirus to learn something about how we can better respond to uh, the climate crisis and climate threat. Turns out we didn't do so well on, on the coronavirus as well. But let me just sort of show you a, 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 a few data that come from six waves that we started uh, in April of 2020, where we followed a representative sample of Americans uh, 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 through their experiences with COVID-19 uh, and also uh, climate change. Um, and we asked them a variety of questions about you know, sort of their beliefs about both of these uh, uh, issues uh, and the actions on them. Um, and uh, the question is, well, who takes actions on climate change, uh, which is uh, the, the red line or on COVID-19, the blue line? And is it a function of sort of risk as feelings, you know, the fact that sort of we worry is, is, is an emotional variable 
as opposed to a, a calculation based variable. And uh, it doesn't matter how you assess worry or how you assess the importance to act, which we did in, in a variety of different ways, but you see a very strong positive relationship for both of those. So, but it, it takes it takes this personal experience of being concerned about something, this, 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 this emotional signal to actually take action, to motivate action. So then the question is, well, what predicts worry? Since worry is a driving force, what predicts uh, worry about uh, both COVID and, 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 and climate change? Uh, and yeah, you know, this uh, measuring that at the beginning of of, of COVID, you know, I think it's in wave two. As you can see, there's huge political polarization on both issues. People are more concerned this, at, at the time. This was in August of 2020. People were more concerned, by and large, with COVID on the right than with climate change on the on the left. But you don't need a statistical test to see that Republicans are far less concerned than 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 Democrats and the independents somewhere in the middle. Uh, and that is basically sort of you know sort of their ideology. What they're being told, uh, they're imitating you know, sort of the, the, the attitudes uh, and, 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 and beliefs of, of, of uh, trusted others. Uh, and uh, then the question is, well, does negative experience change worry? Uh, and as you can see uh, on the bottom on x-axis, we, we have no negative experience on the left and uh, a large amount of negative personal experience on the right. Uh, and that increases perceived worry uh, for, for both issues, not surprisingly. Uh, but also what's interesting to see is that this increase in, in worry as a function of personal experience is far steeper for Republicans uh, than for uh, Democrats. That's actually very consistent with all sorts of learning models, risk caller wagner model that says we are more likely to update our prior belief on something, the more surprising the new information is. Uh, and so we're Republicans you know, sort of experiencing these negative consequences uh, realized that what they thought was a harmless issue or, 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 or some bullshit uh, uh, issue, uh, in, in fact, sort of was quite serious. That increased their worry and uh, out to the point of being no, no longer statistically significantly different from the, the worries of Democrats and also then increased the, the actions in that domain. So uh, what is the takeaway from that study? The takeaway is that worry is oftentimes partisan. Democrats were more worried about Republicans, uh, even after controlling for local incidence rates and demographics and material factors. Uh, so the believe, believing is seeing dynamic, but then when personal experience kicks in uh, uh, and uh, increases worry about the risk, it also increases you know, their the willingness to take action, even when it involves personal monetary costs. And so this is very much uh, in the category of seeing as believing. Uh, and, and, and shows that personal experience actually narrows the partisan divide for both issues. So personal experience dominates you know, uh, partisan, partisan beliefs. Um, is there an information deficit uh, in, in, in either one of those two domains, in particular on climate change? I would think not so much anymore in, in Western countries, but our knowledge about climate change. Uh, but there is a concern, uh, there's a def information deficit about our knowledge, about the concerns of others, and, and also about the actions we can take. Uh, there's a lot of evidence on pluralistic ignorance, uh, where people don't realize, this is another representative sample of Americans in a different study, uh, where we basically found that on average, you know, sort of something like uh, between 66 and 80 percent of Americans supported uh, certain policies uh, designed to reduce climate change, uh, and also sort of felt at least somewhat worried about climate change, but they actually believed that that was only true, but for half uh, of, 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 of other Americans for whom that was actually true. So they only thought that was true for 30 or 40 percent when it was true for 67 or 80 percent. So what are my general conclusions uh, on the limits to collective action? I think our conclusions on those limits depend a lot what assumptions we make about who makes the decisions you know, that, uh, about collective action or action in general. Is it homo economicus and homo sapiens? Uh, Calculation-based decisions are only a subset of the ways in which we process information. Uh, and those calculations are oftentimes influenced by local context, by the compared to what. So it's not even sort of the normative answers to calculation-based decisions, but the more loss aversion and prospect theory uh, shaped uh, dis uh, decision patterns that we should expect to see. Emotions also play a role. Uh, the pride of being part of the solution or the guilt of being part of the problem. In general, I think it's better to uh, elicit positive emotions because uh, uh, 
negative emotions are quite powerful in getting immediate action, but nobody likes to be in a negative mood state for a long period of time. Uh, and so people sort of uh, might, might be tempted to, to tune out if, if you're eliciting negative emotions rather than positive emotions. And then also social norms and rules play a role, norms of fairness and equity that are enforced by hardwired social emotions, outrage uh, when, when, when you see uh, rule violations to that. Um, and then sort of keeping in mind that personal experience and the associated emotions that come with personal experience trump social limitations and trump sort of following uh, the, the, the guidelines and rules of others. So I think the takeaway uh, for collective action is to solicit it in multiple ways uh, and not to rely uh, entirely on just financial incentives uh, or the, you know, the incentives that uh, Homo economicus uh, would be motivated by, but you know, to use a full range of processing modes uh, and uh, motivations uh, that come with being part and parcel of uh, uh, Homo sapiens. So with that, I thank you for your scarce attention and will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Um, if we have a few minutes for questions, um, Thomas? Thanks, Elka. That was really cool. Um, it's nice to see all that stuff together uh, and also the stuff you've done. So you've done a lot of stuff on different political ideologies. And I wonder, we over the last couple of days, we've talked a lot about social networks. And I wonder if you know the extent to which conservatives or Democrats have different kinds of social networks and the extent to which they update their beliefs about things, if that's in any way related. Uh, that maybe that's asking too much, um, but maybe maybe you have some ideas. Yeah, about it, 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 it's a great question. And I'm, I'm not an expert on, on, on social networks, but I, I, I do read the literature a little bit. And as you know, sort of, there's a lot of questions about, you know, sort of how how do we become so polarized? Yeah, you know? and, and there's there's no question that our current technology that allows us to stay within our own bubbles, you know, which means sort of networks that that more likely connect you with with like-minded people than with people who have different opinions, probably has have have a lot to do uh, with. Uh, uh, the, the the increase in polarization that we've seen because we can now we can select you know sort of to 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 not be connected you know uh, in in the way everybody else is uh, and I, I think there there are some studies you know are coming out of Simon Levin's lab and I might even be an author on, on one of them that that show that heterogeneity in beliefs is okay you know, we need heterogeneity in in beliefs and in preferences for functioning democracy but right? if everybody wanted the same same thing then there would be sort of no room for trade. Uh, and no win-win solutions. But I think when when sort of the heterogeneity sort of gets combined, you know, with with the ability sort of to shape your own networks, you know, in 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 ways that limit your access, you know, to to disconfirming evidence and disconfirming beliefs, that I think when 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 becomes dysfunctional. Right, right. Is is there on just in this, uh, the the second part of the question is is there any mm -hmm. evidence that Republicans or conservative Democrats update their beliefs about things at different rates? You know, if you give them information. I've, I've no, I've no idea. I mean, I think that's it, it's a really good question. I mean, there's some sort of there, there's some work by Phil Tetlock, I think, sort of like 20, 30 years ago, about differences between Democrats and Republicans. But it wasn't so much about updating of beliefs. And as we know, there's also you know sort of these differences in moral moral values. I, I I would be skeptical in in thinking that sort of the updating that is a, is a different process with different parameters. It just might be that it's a, it's a difference in inputs. Yeah. You know? Right. Thank you. Makes sense. Thank you. So thank you very much. A very nice talk. And um, so I was wondering. Uh, so you you talk about these uh, uh, different ways of uh, taking decision, calculation based or emotion based, and uh, so. Uh, but essentially, uh, I was. I mean, one one thing of calculation-based model of taking decision is that uh, there's nothing to do with your identity in the sense it has only to do with the problem whereas you right. were showing evidence that identity matters a lot in political mm -hmm. decisions or say in decisions mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. I mean political identity matters so is this included in uh, uh, in the emotional uh, uh, rule-based decision or uh, so I mean because uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how should one formalize this uh, uh, mm -hmm. so 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 I would think 
your social identity enters in in two ways. It enters into uh, the, the 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 rules of conduct that you would would, would consider and 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 the social role that you sort of you 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 take on. And so, if you don't think there's sort of room for for government to do anything, sort of you know, you might have a very different attitude about you know what is acceptable behavior of a politician, for example. Uh, so I think that's one way. The other one I think is you know, sort of the, what what emotions get triggered when you when you see certain certain behaviors or when you see certain uh, you know sort of st states of the world. Uh, and uh, so again, you know, sort of when, when when you see a government official you know sort of issuing a a, a guideline on, on 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 COVID, you know if you're a Democrat, you might think, oh, this is wonderful <laughs> because somebody's taking care of me. And if you're a Republican, you might think this is horrible because they're restricting my personal freedom. So, so I, I think uh, the, you know, the the the, uh, the modes are sort of operating in parallel, but I think they 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 trigger different things. Yes, the calculation-based decisions in some sense shouldn't show differences in in, in political ideology, right? Because it's just the outcomes, right? Uh, and 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 that's also an interesting uh, uh, sort of body of research around sort of whether you should expect uh, spillover effects of, of let's say some pro-social pro behavior you 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 did something very pro-social at work and does that mean now you also become sort of more pro-social at, at, at home will, will there be spillover from one decision to to subsequent decisions uh and yeah when when people make calculation based decisions there should not be any spillover right because it's just based on the merit of the next decision you know you, you calculated the best uh, this decision in, in at time one and at time two you do the same and there should be no sort of connection between those two uh but if if the initial decision to be pro-social was made out of some let's say feeling of guilt or fear uh in some emotion-based fashion typically what you find is especially for negative emotions you know, the flag goes down you know, so if you're no longer worried about something when you've done one thing and so therefore you that might actually be negative spillover you know if, if that decision was motivated by emotion-based decisions on the other hand if you made that initial decision in a in a role or rule-based fashion, and therefore sort of reinforced your personal identity as being a conscientious citizen, yeah, or, 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 or a good parent, whatever it might be, then that identity should be more more active, you know, at at at, at time two, uh, because he just reinforced it before, and you might see positive spillover. So I think sort of this this multiple modes model. Uh, can get a lot of play. On the one hand, it provides you with more entry points in 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 shaping decisions, but it also might make predictions about, you know, as as you said, you know, about sort of the impact of different political identities or about spillover effects. Okay, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. We are out of time, but uh, it was great to see you. And um, otherwise, everyone, uh, we have ten minutes until Simon Levin's talk. He will start a little bit earlier because he needs to leave earlier. So please grab your coffee, your croissant, and come back now. All right, thank you. Thank you, Elton.